All right, thank you, Torn. Appreciate that. Uh, did we miss you last week? Yes, we did miss him last week, and uh, we are, appreciate Torn and his hard work back there. He's got a great singing voice. Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, I'd like, Torn, I'm going to read today from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 1. But before I do, um, I want to acknowledge the fact that this weekend is Memorial Day. Now, that's a, uh, a United States holiday. Uh, it's specifically um, something that, that uh, grew up and, and came into being uh, actually at, right after the Civil War. In fact, within, uh, just within the first weeks of the conclusion of the Civil War, uh, the practice began um, in 1865. Uh, Lee's army surrendered in April, uh, the week before Easter in 1865, and approximately a month later, the first recorded example of decoration of graves of Civil War veterans um, were, was as a documented case of uh, freed slaves in Charleston, South Carolina, decorating the graves of uh, those men that fought for their for their freedom and uh, and before long towns across uh, the United States uh, began to just spontaneously began uh, the practice in the springtime of decorating uh, Civil War veterans graves and in 1868 just a few years later uh, a former general named um, let's see I wrote his name down here uh, John A. Logan uh, he was the leader of an organization for Northern Civil War veterans, and in 1868 he called for a nationwide day of remembrance, and he chose May 30th uh, for a day which was called at that time Decoration Day because they decorated the graves of the Civil War veterans. And he chose May 30th because uh, there were no battles that took place on the 30th of May, and so it didn't have any particular uh, association but after World War I uh, what was formerly called Decoration Day and was uh, primarily uh, originated with the honoring of the Civil War dead uh, after World War I it evolved into a holiday to commemorate uh, all American military personnel who died in all wars not just the Civil War uh, it was after World War II that the name changed from Decoration Day to Memorial Day and at that time, uh, it was declared a, an official Monday holiday, as it is today, uh, by a federal law in 1967. Uh, they passed a law to uh, you know, get all these uh, different holidays and put them on Mondays so that federal employees could have a, a long weekend. And so that's how it came to be on uh, the last Monday of, of May. So that's a little background history of uh, Memorial Day. But the idea of keeping things in remembrance and remembering and memory uh, is an important one in the New Testament. Of course, what I just described for you is a specifically, uh, you know, re more or less recent uh, innovation. But the idea of keeping something important or someone important in memory, you'll recall that um, at the Last Supper, when Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new Testament and uh, yeah, shed for many for the remission of sins and he took the bread and he broke it and said this is my body broken for you. One of the Gospels records that he also said do this in remembrance of me. Now that didn't mean, he didn't mean by that uh, in a kind of a, a sentimental way like um, let's don't forget about Jesus. Um, that's not what he meant. He meant keep in memory what what this represents, what this cup represents, what this bread represents, what this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, what it produced, what it did. And in fact, uh, this is exactly the point that Paul makes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'd like to read it. Now, you know, this is chapter 15 of this letter to the Corinthians. Keep in mind that the Corinthians are Apostle Paul's own converts uh, in this town of Corinth. And he's writing to them, uh, not because they don't know what he had to say, they did. He stayed with them for a year and a half, Book of Acts tells us, before he moved on. 
So they heard him preach a lot. They knew what his message was. But he was uh, uh, taking great care that they keep the important things uh, in memory, that they keep them fresh in their minds. He wanted to emphasize the things that are most important. And so here at the end of this letter, he says, now I'm reading from King James translation. Let's just read verse one. He says, by the way, keep in mind, this is the conclusion of the letter. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now, he doesn't mean by that, I'm presenting it to you for the first time, because he says, which I preached to you. In other words, they've already heard the message that he calls the gospel. He says, which I preached to you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. Uh, now, there's some really important thoughts here in this uh, long verse with all these different clauses uh, contained between the commas. First of all, when he said, I declare unto you the gospel, uh, the word that's uh, translated declare in this verse, thought you'd want to know, uh, I looked it up, uh, gno ridzo, uh, it comes from the word gnosis, uh, and it means to make known, but it actually is derived uh, by way of another ver uh, word, a uh, Greek word, gnosko. Now this is what's important, it doesn't mean like a declaration like, uh, I, I just want to proclaim a proclamation. It, the word it's derived from, ginosko, means something that you understand, something that you perceive. Now, it's one thing to stand up and make an announcement, you know, or make a proclamation, but what the word is actually getting at is something that you uh, comprehend, something that you perceive, something that you understand. Um, and so he's saying, uh, you could say it that way, more of a brethren, I want you to understand. I want to be sure you understand. That's what he's saying. And if you'll remember last week, if I can make a connection to something we talked about last week, uh, when we were talking about the parable of the sower and uh, Jesus, that's one uh, parable that is recorded in three of the four Gospels, and it's an important one. And uh, Jesus described a sower sowing a seed, and he describes all these different places where the seed fell, and, and it, for whatever reason, was unfruitful. But then he gets to the end, and he says, this is the good ground where the seed produced what it's supposed to produce. And in one of the Gospels, uh, I think it's Matthew's Gospel, he said, the good ground are those who hear the word and understand it. You see, uh, in other words, they grasp it. Uh, it doesn't if you don't understand it, then uh, it's not going to do what it's supposed to. It's important to understand it. So Paul is saying basically the same thing. He said, I want to be sure you understand uh, the gospel, or you perceive it, or you have a, you know, what we would say, have a handle on it, have a, gr a grasp of it. Uh, let me uh, read this to you in um, a couple of other translations. This is the expanded Bible. He says, now, brothers and sisters, I want you to remember or to be clear about. Uh, see, the expanded Bible is like the amplified Bible. It gives you different ways that the Greek language could be possibly understood here. It says, I want you to remember, and then in brackets it says, or be clear about. I think both of those are good. He wants them to remember. See, they've heard it. They've heard his message, but he's saying, I want you to remember it or keep it fresh in your mind and be clear about what it is, the good news that I brought to you. Here it is from the Living Bible. I like the Living Bible. It's pretty clear in many cases. Uh, the Living Bible says, Now let me remind you, brothers, of what the gospel really is. For it has not changed. It is the same good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still do now. For your faith is squarely built upon this wonderful message. Now that gets us to the latter part of the verse. So the first part where in King James it says, I declare unto you the gospel, the best way to uh, understand that is he's saying, I want you to remember, I want you to understand, I want you to be clear about what the gospel is. So he's bringing it up here at the end of this letter. Um, by the way, let me just add this. Sometimes as Christians, we uh, make some assumptions that are not necessarily true. Uh, uh, sometimes Christians assume, well, the gospel is a message for unbelievers. Uh, a gospel is a message you preach when you set up a tent on the outskirts of town and you get a bunch of curious uh, unbelievers who've never been 
Christians before and they come wandering in and you say now come down here to the front of the church to the altar and and get saved and and that's what the gospel is for but Paul here is is presenting and he's saying it's important and he's not talking about unbelievers he's talking about people who are already Christians and he's saying it's important for you to keep it fresh in your mind and be clear about it. he's writing to Christians uh, just like us in uh, in the Corinthians here so uh, it's a message that's important uh, for us and he's going to get to it here in a second um, he says which I preach to you and he says which you received and then at the end he says wherein you stand that means that our f upon this message our Christian life is built now I just quoted to you the uh, Living Bible um, and at, at that last phrase it says your faith is squarely built upon this wonderful message in other words uh, our faith or our confidence in God or our confidence or trust in Christ is not just a free-floating thing it's not just some aimless I have faith it's built squarely upon a specific message is what he's saying uh, here's another translation this is from a translation called the names of God Bible and it says brothers and sisters I'm making known to you the good news which I already told you which you received and it says on which your faith is based that's what he means our faith is based or our faith is resting squarely upon this message now earlier in this letter to the Corinthians of course you know uh, ideally we would sit down and and read the whole thing from start to finish then we'd have it all in context but we don't have that kind of time if you'll recall let me just bring it uh, to your recollection earlier in this epistle uh, to the Corinthians uh, he says to them that uh, he makes an analogy uh, he says you are like God's building meaning the church the church at Corinth and, and we're the same in the same condition he says you're like a building of God and I'm the architect and like a good master builder he said I laid the foundation and he said the foundation uh, there's only one foundation and it's Christ and we've talked about that before and he means by that the same thing he's saying here uh, the foundation upon which our Christian experience rests is a message and that's what he's reminding them of because our whole Christian life is connected to or built upon or uh, attached to this foundational message it's not something we forget about and go on to bigger and better things we're supposed to always stay focused on the foundational message upon which our faith is built um, so let's go on to the next verse you can tell that he's really focused on this and he really thinks it's important so he said I remind you of the gospel which I preached to you which you received uh, wherein you stand verse 2 says by which that is to say referring to that message by which you're saved he says and then he adds if you keep in memory what I preached to you unless you believed in vain now let's talk about all those things uh, in by which you're saved now uh, I like to say and uh, I've I've come to see it this way and I think it's a more clear way of understanding see I don't like churchy words I don't like religious words I don't like words that have a church connotation or a religious connotation words that we hear in church and we think of them as church words I would just like to eliminate that and erase all of that and forget about the church context just pretend like it doesn't exist and just say what do these words mean just in just as words forget the church forget 2,000 years of Christian experience like saved that's a word we hear in church let's forget that we've ever heard that in church with all of its baggage the word saved is based on the word safe it's like something or someone is rescued and is now safe uh, it's removed from a situation of jeopardy and now in a situation of safety or security um, no more jeopardy uh, the analogy that I like because it's so vivid is uh, at a baseball game after the player runs around the bases we all know if you've ever seen a baseball game how this works all the time he's running around the bases uh, the other team is 
trying to tag him out, right? And if he's tagged out, he has to leave the field. He's eliminated. He's tagged out. He has to go back to the dugout. So he's in jeopardy. But when he gets all the way around the bases and he comes sliding into home plate, the imp goes like this. He makes this kind of a symbol and he says, safe. Big, loud words. Safe, he says. What that means is that player is no longer in jeopardy. He can't be tagged out anymore. Uh, he's safe. Now, <clears throat> Christians in their mind many times think that uh, is something that we'll experience when we die and go to heaven. And, and that creates a lot of anxiety for some Christians because they think, I've, I hope I can make it, you see, as though I'm in jeopardy right now and I just hope I can somehow, you know, and you hear this kind of language, by hook or by crook, you know, if I can just sneak in the back door of heaven. And, but that's nonsense. Uh, there's no sneaking in the back door of heaven. And there's no by hook or by crook. God doesn't work by hook or by crook. It's not that situation at all. And it's not about dying and going to heaven. You notice Paul here doesn't say when you die and go to heaven, you'll be safe. He says, because you believe this message, this message is all about you right now in the present tense being uh, in a position of safety where God is concerned, no longer in jeopardy where God is concerned. Of course, not to take anything away, when our bodies are worn out, when uh, these physical bodies can't f function anymore as a vehicle for our spirit, uh, Christians go to heaven. Uh, the spirit departs and goes to where Christ is. And uh, that's what Paul says. To depart and be with Christ is far better. And he doesn't put any qualifications on it. He never, Paul never says... Uh, to depart and be with Christ is far better if you've done enough good things so you can somehow make it in by hook or by crook. He never says things like that. Christians mistakenly say that. Like one lady I was talking to one time, and I don't want to go back and tell all these stories again. Uh, I asked her, she, they asked me to come pray for her, and I asked her if she was a Christian. And she, she didn't say yes or no. She said, I've been in church all my life, which doesn't answer the question. Uh, and before I could answer her and say anything else, she said, I just hope I've done enough good things so I can make it in. And I thought to myself in that moment, that's really pathetic, you know. That's not really what the gospel is. And I thought, you know, the reason she's got this mistaken idea is because she was in church all her life and she heard all the wrong things. It's, it's, see, Paul never did say, uh, to depart and be with Christ is far better, but I hope you're good enough like me. He didn't say anything like that. It's true of all Christians. See, by definition, a Christian... Uh, well, first of all, by definition, nobody's good enough. There's none righteous, no, not one. And by definition, a Christian is good enough because you believe in the one who is good enough, which is Christ. Let me just remind you, see Paul's reminding them, that there is none righteous, no, not one, uh, except for Jesus. Jesus is the only one who is righteous. Jesus is the only one who is holy. Christians, there is no Christian alive or dead in the past or in the present tense who is holy. Only by virtue of the holiness of Christ. Uh, there is no Christian alive or dead at any time in the past or in the present tense who is righteous. Only Christ is righteous. Christians are righteous because we believe in the righteous. We believe in Jesus who's already right. And he, uh, see we come into a connection with him and we get the benefit of his righteousness. We are safe because we put our faith, that, you notice how Paul emphasizes this, um, wherein you stand, wherein your faith is based, <clears throat> and you are safe. See, that's what I want to emphasize. He doesn't say you will be when you die and get to heaven. Just hope you make it like me. I hope you're as good as me. He doesn't say that. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not conditional upon you being good enough. Uh, it's conditional on Christ being good enough. And Paul is emphasizing that it's not a future situation that's in doubt, it's a present tense reality about which there is no doubt. Uh, he says, by which, by this message, you are safe. I'd like to just not use the church word saved. I'd like to say safe. You're in a condition of safety, security, where God is concerned. I think that's more healthy to think of it that way. Now, he says that. And you see, he's reminding them of this message that he preached to them. He said, I preached it to you. You received it. 
and, uh, and it's upon which your faith is built. And uh, it's by this message that you have entered in this condition of safety. And he says, now keep it in memory. That's what he says in the next part. If you keep in memory that which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me just read this to you from uh, some other translations. Uh, this word, uh, this expression, keep in memory, if you look it up in uh, various translations, which is easy to do nowadays, you can look at online Bibles, and uh, the one I use, you can enter in a particular verse, and it will show you all the English translations, and you can just read them all and see what they all say, what the consensus is. And what the consensus is on this expression where it says, if you keep in memory, if the ones that don't say keep in memory say this, if you hold fast, if you hold fast. In other words, he's encouraging them to hold, hold on. Now, this gets me back, if I can make another, what do they call that, a callback. <laughs> I'm going to make a, a reference to last week when we talked about Jesus gave that important parable, the sower sows the word. Now, what I emphasized last week is that uh, when he talks about the good ground, the seed that fell on good ground, that's talking about a Christian. See, uh, all those other ones are talking about people in his day that were resistant to the word and it was unfruitful. He came unto his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the right or the privilege to become the sons of God. The good ground is describing Christians. All Christians, by definition, are what he described in that parable as the good ground. And it's interesting to see what the Gospels say in the definition of what Jesus said the good ground means. Because the disciples came later and said, what does this parable mean? Well, when he comes to the ground that is good, that is fruitful, he said, the good ground in Matthew's Gospel are those who hear and understand. But in Mark and in Luke, he says something like this. The good ground are those who hear the word and hold on to it or hold fast. Uh, well, I think in Luke's gospel it says keep it. And we read the Greek word last week and it means to hold on to or hold fast to. Now, uh, see, again, this isn't something to make you feel like, well, I hope I am. Well, you are. You, you see, you wouldn't be sitting here in church on a Sunday morning listening to me stand up here and talk about this unless you took it seriously and were holding fast to it. That's what Paul is here. He's saying here the same thing that Jesus said in the parable of the sower. It amazes me sometimes when I read, and I've seen this a lot, theologians who say, who try to make the case that Paul is presenting a different message than Jesus presented. To me, they're in perfect harmony. Uh, he, when he says here, uh, if you keep in memory, most of the other translations say, if you hold fast to that message, that gospel that I preach, he's encouraging them to hold on to it. Don't let it slip out of your grasp. Here's, the, again, the Names of God translation. It says, in addition, you are saved by this good news if you hold on to what I taught you, unless you believed it without thinking it over. <laughs> you see, that's what he's saying. He, he's not trying to create any insecurity. In fact, just the opposite. The New American Standard Bible says, by which you're saved if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you. Um, hold firmly. You see what he's emphasizing here is, I preached this message to you, you received it, and uh, this is the foundation upon which your faith is built. And it's the, it's the only thing that is your, um, what I say, your certificate of safety. This is the thing that tells you or lets you know that you are safe. Uh, you know, years ago, and I don't want to be critical, I, I hate, you know, I don't want to do this, but I want you to understand. Uh, some years ago, and I think it's pride, I think, on my part, I think, uh, you know, um, I used to engage in fruitless, useless conversations with, and I don't want to be, seem like I'm critical, people who come to your door uh, that you didn't invite, and who have religious literature to give you, and then they want to talk to you about it, now, uh, what I do now is if they, you see, they never come back to my house. I think they put uh, a mark on my uh, doorstep that said, don't, don't bother with this one, because they don't come around anymore. Um, but I used to engage 
uh, uh, one particular person in, in hours and literally a long time, long conversations, until it, it finally dawned on me that they weren't coming to hear, they were closed to anything I had to say. It was not really a conversation. Uh, in fact, they are taught not to listen to anything you say. They're taught to ignore everything you say, so it's not a conversation. They want you to join with their uh, separate group and uh, go, you know, submit to their teachings. They don't want to hear what you have to say, so I wasted my time. But in some of those conversations, I did gain some insight into what the thinking is. So we were discussing at one time this idea of saved or safe. And uh, I was presenting it the way I'm presenting it to you right now based on this verse and many, many others. And, you know, it's all throughout. It's Paul's whole message. And so I, I, I finally asked this person, well, the way you're telling it, see, what he was saying to me is you have to do enough good things. You have to do enough good things so you can merit. And only a certain number of people will be saved. And once that quota is filled, nobody else can get in. And I said to him, finally, how are you going to know? How are you going to know if you've done enough? How are you going to know if you've done enough good things? He says, well, we never will know. We never will know until we get there and find out. And I said, well, as for me, that's too late. <laughs> you know, I need, I'd like to know something right now because if it's about, if we never will know until we get there, know we've done enough good things, uh, that creates in me a sense of insecurity. Now, I know why, I can understand why that's presented to people. That's like a, a, a carrot and a stick. Well, that's, that's the stick. That's like a way of, of beating on you and saying, you better get out here and work for us. And like he, see, he felt that by coming to my house, for instance, and wasting that time talking to me, he was doing meritorious things that was earning his ticket to get in. Um, but that's, you see, do you notice that that's nothing like what Paul is presenting here? He says, keep in memory, uh, I'm trying to remember now why I, how I got off on that. Um, <clears throat> keep in memory what I pre, don't let us hold firmly to this. This is the foundation. Um, now that last part of, of the verse where he says, unless you believed in vain in King James translation. Let me read that to you from some other translations. Uh, the easy to read version says, this good news, this message you heard from me is God's way of saving you. But you must continue believing it. If you don't, you believe for nothing. In other words, he's saying if you, if you don't continue in it, what good is it? That's all that means. If you don't keep on, you know, holding on to it, then what's the value, you know, if you let it go? Uh, so he's encouraging them not to let it go. That's all that means. Uh, let's, uh, let's read this verse 2 from the message translation. Torin, could you put that up here? Um, let's see. Let's go back to verse 1. Let's get verse 1 so we get the beginning of the sentence. Friends, let me go over this message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed, that I make, uh, that I that you made your own, this message on which you took your stand. Okay, verse 2. And by which your life has been saved. I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not a passing fancy, and that you're in this for good and holding fast. You see, that's all he's getting at here. He's saying, I assume you've taken this seriously. Uh, let me read this verse 2 f to you from... Uh, the New International Reader's Version. Because you believed the good news, you are saved. But you must hold firmly to this message I preach to you. If you don't, you've believed it for nothing. In other words, he's saying, hold on to it. Don't let it go. Now, uh, here he says, I'm reminding you, and we spent a long time talking about how he said I'm reminding you. What is it then? He said, I'm reminding you of it. Well, here it is. Look at verse 3. Torn, I'm going back to the King James translation. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, uh, you see, you might think, well, sure, of course, you know. I mean, that's like the fundamental idea of Christianity. Do you know that there are theologians who say that Paul invented this, that Paul made it up? Uh, I, I, I see this more, more than you would expect. Um, the idea is that Jesus preached a message of morality and ethics and love thy neighbor and, uh, you know, that kind of a message. 
But Jesus never said anything about a, a sacrifice for sins. Yeah, and Paul made that up. That's what some theologians say, which amazes me because I think, why, you know, how can you think that? You must not have read very carefully. What about at the Last Supper? I quoted that to you a moment ago. Jesus said, this cup is my blood of the New Testament. Jesus said that. Isn't that basically what, uh, this is my blood of the New Testament shed for many for the remission of sins. Isn't that basically what Paul says here? And you notice that Paul says, uh, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Who did he receive it from? It wasn't Peter, James, and John. It wasn't from the people who were followers of Jesus before him. If you keep on reading into the book of Galatians, he says, the gospel that I preach is not of men. I didn't receive it from man. I was not taught it. It came by revelation directly from Christ himself. Jesus gave him the message. Jesus told him what to say. And notice this, Jesus also told him, uh, Christ died for our sin. Notice he says, according to the scriptures. In other words, not according to me, Paul, who made it up. Uh, this isn't an idea that Paul's presenting just out of, like out of the air. It just, it just, I had a dream one night and here's, my, here's what it is. He didn't say, I dreamed it up. This is according to the scriptures. Um, now, before we uh, just take a brief look at some of the scriptures, by the scriptures, he means the old, what we are calling the Old Testament. For a Jewish person, that was their scriptures. Uh, let me just, um, for a moment, just take a little side journey and uh, point out to you that Jesus made this exact same point. Torrin, if you would, would you, Torrin, give me Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, beginning with verse 25. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, beginning with verse 25. And this is after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And a couple of disciples are walking on the road to a place called uh, Emmaus. And Jesus came and walked along next to them, but they didn't recognize him. And he says, hey, why are you all so sad? And they said, well, maybe you haven't heard. Well, you know, this man Jesus, uh, he was taken and, you know, put to death. And we thought he was the one who was going to save Israel. And, uh, and then finally, in, in ver after he listens to them talk about this for a while, he, see, they didn't recognize him. That's what the text tells us. He finally said to them in verse 25, uh, then he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all, listen, all that the prophets have spoken. He's saying, haven't you ever heard what's actually written in the scriptures? Or well, what is it? What have the prophets spoken? Verse 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Uh, suffered these things, meaning being put to death, as they were talking about earlier. He's talking about the death that Jesus died. You see, this is not something Paul invented. Uh, Jesus himself said, this is what the scriptures are about. Uh, the prophets spoke it. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I would have liked to have heard that. I bet it was very enlightening. Uh, all in Moses, that means the first five books of the New Testament, Old Testament, I mean, you know, for, for them, the scriptures. And in the prophets, like Isaiah, for instance, um, things concerning himself. Now, uh, and then uh, when they got near to the town they were going to, they uh, said, uh, well, why don't you stay here with us? Uh, but then he was parted from them, and they thought, wow, that must have been Jesus. So they got all excited, and they ran back to Jerusalem and found the 12. And they said, we saw Jesus, and uh, while they're talking, he appeared to them. And now he's there back with them again. And so I'm going to skip down to verse 44. And um, he took a piece of food, and he ate it to prove that he was really there. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't some kind of, you know, fantasy. And now listen to what he says to them. This is, this is a, in the same occasion here, just a little later. Verse 44 says, He said unto them, These things are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you. Listen, that all the things, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He said, 
in the, in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms, uh, they concern me. Verse 45 says, Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. What is it that they understood? What they understood was this is about Jesus. This is about his death on the cross. This is about what Paul said, Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The next verse says in verse 46, He said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it uh, behooved Christ to suffer. He means in his death. And to rise from the dead the third day, verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning first at Jerusalem. Now you get what he's saying here? Uh, the scriptures are about the suffering or the death of Jesus and the result is that there is remission or discharge from the penalty from sins. When it says repentance, by the way, I'll just remind you that the Greek word translated repentance is metanoia. Meta means overall, and noia means thinking, a change of thinking. Think, you, have to, you have to see things differently. That's why he opened their understanding and they understood the scriptures. Now, uh, we're not going to take time and go through Moses and all the prophets and the Psalms. Let's just take one as an example. Uh, this is in Isaiah chapter 53, and this is the most familiar one. This is the one, uh, I'm going to start torn. Isaiah chapter 53, I'm going to start with a verse 4. And this one is so obviously about uh, Jesus. It fits so perfectly that for many years, um, Jewish scholars tried to deny that this was a part, a legitimate part of the Old Testament. There were actually uh, Jewish uh, scholars who claimed that this Isaiah 53 was sort of grafted in, and that it didn't really belong there, that some Christian scribe put it in there uh, because it's so obviously about Jesus. Um, until, let's see, this was, an, this was a common idea uh, that Isaiah 53, you can disregard that because some Christian put that in there. It's illegitimate, doesn't belong there. Until, uh, in the 1940s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they dated, they could date these Dead Sea Scrolls to the time uh, before Christ. And guess what they found? An intact scroll with the entire book of Isaiah. In fact, if you go to Israel today, they have a, a building. It's a big circular building. And it's the, I think they call it the building of the scroll or something like that. But they've got the unwound scroll of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it goes all the way around the building uh, on the wall. And guess what's right in there in the text? Isaiah 53. It wasn't some Christian scribe. This is a text that, this is the oldest version of Isaiah that's ever been discovered, dating before, it was created before Christ even came. And here it is, uh, and it's so obviously about Jesus. Uh, this is the best e example. Here's what it says. Let's start with verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. You see, what did Paul say that he wanted to remind them of? The, the foundation, the thing he wanted them to keep in memory, uh, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. And here it says it explicitly. He was wounded for our transgressions. You see, we are the ones with transgressions. We are the ones who deserve punishment, but he took what we deserved. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, chastisement is punishment, by the way, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now that's pretty strong right there, but he's not done yet. Verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. By the way, I was at a Bible study one time where the person presenting the Bible study read that much of the verse and stopped, and that was his whole topic. Yes, it's terrible. We're, we're awful. We're like sheep who've gone astray. God, he's surely mad at us, you know. And trying to make everybody feel bad, you know, as though by making you feel bad, uh, that will make you straighten up, see. 
And, but that's not what the verse says. The verse doesn't stop and say, all we like sheep have gone astray and everyone turned to his own way. Now you better go away feeling bad about that. Because there's more. You see, at the Bible study I was telling you about, he left off the last part of the verse. The last part of the verse says, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. <laughs> Now, yeah, sure, it's true. All we like sheep have gone astray. Yes, it's true. We've all turned to our own way. Yes, it's true. We've all done things wrong. But the good news is, not that God's mad at you and is going to get you for that. The good news is, He laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Um, that's an important <laughs> little caveat to add, isn't it? Verse 7, He's not done yet. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet He opened not His mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Listen. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. That's like Paul saying how Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, here are the scriptures. And the truth is, what Paul is saying, this is the foundation of our faith. This is where he wants, what's he, what he wants you to hold fast to. But he's not done yet. He made his grave with the wicked, in verse 9, and with the rich in his death. This is so obviously, you know, talking about Jesus, who fulfilled this perfectly. Uh, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10 says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When he shall, when, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. You know, uh, it, it amazes me that a theologian could say, well, Paul invented this idea of Jesus as uh, giving his life as, a, as an offering for sin. Uh, not only did Jesus mention it at the Last Supper, here Isaiah says it here. Uh, thou shalt make his life, his soul, an offering for sin. He shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11 said, He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. That's saying God shall see the suffering of Jesus, and he'll be satisfied with that. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. That means he will remove their guilt and its consequences. That's what the um, Amplified Translation says. Uh, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, uh, again, this is pretty clear, and this is, you can see, precisely what Paul said when he was writing to the Corinthians, and he said, I want to remind you of this message that I preached to you, and I want you to keep it in memory, and I want you to realize that your faith is built on this truth, and then when he presents it, this is what he said how Christ died for our sin according to the scriptures, how he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. The question then is why? Why, uh, why does Paul want you to keep that in memory? The reason he wants you to keep that in memory is because if you don't, you'll start thinking that, uh, that God's mad at you. You'll start thinking that maybe God's upset. You'll start thinking maybe God's disappointed with me because of my failures, because of my flaws. What you're supposed to do is take your eyes off of yourself because it's not about you, because it's never been about you. It's never been about your performance. But Paul, the reason he says this is essential for you to keep in memory and to keep focused on, and it's the foundation, it's because it relieves us of the, of the cloud of, of, of guilt or uh, insecurity or inferiority. We now understand that we have perfect access to God, perfect relationship with God, because it's not built on us, it's not built on our performance, which as long as you're alive will always be a flawed performance. But our faith is in Christ whose performance was flawless. And he's a perfect savior and he's perfectly righteous and he's perfectly holy and our relationship with God is based on that and not on ourselves. And I think that's why Paul is so insistent that his readers keep it in memory and keep it fresh uh, in your mind, and why he took the time to remind them of it, and why I'm taking time to remind me and you of it uh, as well. Okay, I think that's all we've got today. Thank you for listening so patiently.